Hello passengers, and welcome aboard the TV Pilot's License with service to Philadelphia and the world-famous Patty's Pub. We ask that you please fasten your headphones, secure your podcasting device, and remember, on this podcast, our food and beverage service is provided by Wawa. You may only throw snowballs at Santa while the seatbelt sign is off, and most importantly, go birds! (laughs) <laughs> Welcome to the TV Pilot's License. My name is Jeff Curvis, joined by Rich Enman and Max Singer. How are you boys doing? I'm going to seal the Declaration of Independence. Oh, wait, no, sorry, sorry. Wrong, wrong Philadelphia media. I'm so I'm so sorry. <laughs> that is so funny. I, I would have never thought to call National Treasure Philadelphia media, but uh, <laughs> I... I personally, uh, I, you know, seeing Patty's Pub uh, for the first time again uh, really makes me feel like uh, I, I think it reminds me of a, a street in my neighborhood, Jeff. It reminds me of a, uh, it, yeah, feels, so it feels weird. like Van Nuys, not necessarily yeah, it feels Philadelphia. Like it, it feels very close to you both. But <laughs> this week we are taking a journey to South Philadelphia to meet up with one of the most chaotic gangs that still exists on TV and Boy, doing howdy. the It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia pilot. But before we dive into this pilot, Max, do you mind telling folks what this podcast is all about? Here at TV Pilots License, we break down and analyze the pilot episodes of some of TV's most famous, or in some cases, infamous shows. We learn a little bit more about how these shows came to be and were originally made, if they're effective pilot episodes and making us want to watch more, and if we think they can be made today. Go back and stream our old episodes from wherever you listen to podcasts. Check us out on YouTube and TikTok to see our smiling faces. And if it is your first time flying with us, then welcome aboard. And Rich, what is your question of the week? Well, so this is a, a you know a rare treat where all of us have watched a pretty significant amount of the show, I would say, at, at this yeah. point. Um, it's still on the air. It is still, like, I don't think... I, I don't think either or any one of us has watched that recently. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I would love to know, knowing what you have experienced of each core character. So that's Mac, Dennis, Charlie, D, and Frank. Who are you picking in a apocalypse scenario to defend? To defend, like both of you, to like as a survival scenario. Who are you guys picking? So my answer changes based off of whether or not we're doing the pilot <laughs> or we're doing more than the pilot, right? Um, mm. Because I think that if I am choosing just the pilot, I'm going to go with Charlie. I'm I'm 100% going with Charlie. Charlie seems to do a very good job, even though he is the village idiot amongst a group of idiots. He does a good job of like blending in. He is very aware of his scenarios. Now you would be like, oh, that's great for, you know, an apocalyptic situation. But as the show goes on and on, I do sort of want a Dennis around. I, I, I want oh. him around a little bit just because... This is a guy who has some confidence. This is a guy who can coerce a bunch of people to do something and is listened to. And sometimes you need that in those sorts of situations, even if their ideas are awful. Max, I'm curious, what are you thinking? I appreciate that you've really put the thought into this, Jeff. Like, this was not a question that just got proposed to you. (laughs) And I think it's worth noting for our listeners, like, going back to this pilot, which originally aired in, like, summer of 2005... It feels a lot different totally. Characters have very different mannerisms. There's main parts of the show that haven't even come to fruition yet that we kind of grown to to know and love. So just going off of everything I know about Sunny as a whole, I'll pick a Danny DeVito as Frank Reynolds. I'll give you two reasons why. He's got financial resources and he owns a gun. (laughs) (laughs) And he's going to come out blasting. (laughs) Rich, what about yourself? Uh, that's fascinating. I, you know, I've always often thought of like what good are financial resources in an apocalypse where like we can't all agree that money is going to be worth anything at that point. So that's an interesting pick. Oh, now I, you tell me after I make my pick. <laughs> oh, do you want me to explain how a potential fictional apocalypse is going to happen? No, I understand, but maybe our audience wants to know. <laughs> Max is still banking on the gold standard for yeah, cash. So, He's just like. <laughs> so when we departed from the gold standard of the 1950s, no, I'm kidding. Um, I don't even think that's the right decade. Uh, 
I personally was originally going to go with Charlie based on the one episode that I remember the mo- him being the most competent in. And it's the episode where they essentially spoof the movie Birdman. And that's uh, an episode called Charlie work where they basically do like a solo, uh, like a one single shot of him keeping the bar afloat. However, he's only having to do that because he's bad at his job. <laughs> <laughs> and he has had to essentially put out a thousand fires because he doesn't know what he's doing. I think I'm going with Mac. And the reason okay. is Mac has learned over time how to do certain things. He has not, like stayed with his role of sidekick for a while for where a lot of people and like, you know, if he deters from that, he's an extremely loyal person. And I think he's kind of the only one who really has it together. And also, like, yeah, he's crazy, but how crazy, like, how crazy of views can you really have while you're, like, fighting for survival? None of that matters anymore. None of his Christian shit, none of his, like, anti-gay shit doesn't matter at all. I think I'm, I think I'm going Mac on this one. Yeah, and if you get the actor, Rob McElhenney has a ton of that useless money that you're yeah, worried about you having. Can, you can light it on fire and stay warm through the night. Yeah, exactly. That sounds great. Uh, well, Rich, thank you so much for that very creative question of the week. Let's talk a little bit more about It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, and we're going to start off with a quick synopsis of a group of five narcissistic and sociopathic friends run Correct. an Irish pub in South Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, which... You know, first of all, I think we have to talk about the uh, elephant in the room or the lack of a Jersey Mike spokesperson in the room. And that (laughs) is Danny DeVito is just not in this pilot. One of the critical five does not appear in the pilot. Uh, But before we learn a little bit more about how this show really was perceived by us, let's learn a little bit more about how it got made. And Max, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Today, we are talking about the pilot episode of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, titled The Gang Gets Racist, Bet You Wish This One Was Just Called Pilot, which originally <laughs> aired on August 4th, 2005 on FX. And we'll be talking about the show's creators, yes, and their stars, the trio of Charlie Day, Glenn Howerton, and Rob McElhaney. The trio became friends in the early 2000s after consistently bumping into each other at auditions and sharing a manager at one point in time. Howerton and Day actually screen tested together for Fox's short-lived That 80s Show, in which Howard was Shit. cast as the show's lead, but Day lost out of the role of his best friend to actor Eddie Shin. Howard is a Juilliard grad, while Day spent summers as a performer at the Williamstown Theater Festival in Massachusetts, doing shows alongside a bevy of names you know and love, including Logan Marshall Green, Benjamin McKenzie, Jimmy Simpson, Sterling K. Brown, David Hornsby, Justin Long, and Catherine Hahn. Simpson and Hornsby will later become supporting roles in the It's Always Sunny universe. Day had been making comedic shorts in his apartment with Jimmy Simpson, which inspired Howardson and McElhaney to want to oh, film no. shorts of their own with Day and his friends. The shorts featured dark premises centered around three unemployed actors sharing their namesakes and were inspired by the original British versions of The Office and Curb Your Enthusiasm. Uh, that's original British Office <laughs> and Curb Your Enthusiasm. It's not a British show. Yeah. Um, just clarify for the audience. The gang wrote a longer version around a scenario where a friend goes to borrow sugar from Charlie. You know, like you do from your neighbors in real life. (laughs) With with Charlie revealing he has cancer and the friend trying to find any excuse to get out of the apartment. The short would later go on to become the fourth episode of season one, Charlie Has Cancer. (laughs) McElhaney brought the edited short, It's Always Sunny on TV, named after the AHA song, The Sun Always Shines on TV, a favorite of Howerton's, to his manager who helped get into the hands of an agent who helped get into the hands of seven to eight networks for viewing. The gang gets a first season order from FX with a budget of $450,000, a third of the budget of a standard cable series at the time, and filmed the first episodes on Panasonic DVX-100 mini DV cameras, which was the standard consumer affordable digital camera first released in 2002. This was like the gold standard of like at-home handicam at this point. That's awesome. Absolutely insane. The network wants to retool the concept, ditching the out-of-work actor's premise from the self-produced pilot, with McAuley suggesting a move from L.A. to Philly, his hometown, and setting it at a bar because it was a career that could provide the characters with a lot of free time while also Mm -hmm. being a logical way to sustain themselves financially. FX promotes Sunny as part of its brand new Dark Side of Comedy lineup alongside a show called Starved, which centered around four friends with eating disorders in a shame-based support group called Belt Tighteners. 
The show starred Days Theater Festival Fred Sterling K. Brown alongside Broadway legend Lauren Bernati and Holy Jackie shit. Hoffman. It was canceled for just seven episodes. Rounding out today's cast as Sweet D is Caitlin Olsen, Olsen, a Groundlings alum best known for her role in the final two seasons of The Drew Carey Show, the basis for a joke you may have missed in today's pilot. The role was originally set to be played by actress Jordan Reed, the then girlfriend of McElady, who dropped out after the two broke up in production. She later came back for a guest starring role in 2021. That's insane. Knowing Damn. what then happened between those two. That's that's absolutely bonkers that <laughs> your ex-girlfriend or your ex-girlfriend leaves the show and then the person that replaces them then becomes your wife, who you now have a very happy marriage with, is that's what a what a delightful twist of fate. Um but let's dive into this show. And I think that this show starts off in a super interesting way. We just start off with a timestamp. And we are immediately thrown into not so much knowing these characters or their background, but understanding their situation and then getting to know a little bit more about their ethics or their <laughs> lack thereof ethics. And I want to hear from you two. What were you thinking meeting four of these chaotic human beings? Well, just off off the cuff, I think that the timestamp of like the day and date is such a clever way to get out of having to set up any exposition. It's just mm -hmm. an excuse as a writer to be able to drop you into the middle of any scenario, and you don't have to waste any time in this pilot of getting to know people, establishing relationships, because you're telling the audience, we're just going into it. This is the scene, and you will figure it out. And it changes like the way we look at this pilot compared to a lot of other shows we've done because there's there's no time wasted. We're like right into the action. Yeah, I, I really do like, and, and I actually did not know about the um, the inspiration from both Curb Your Enthusiasm, which I think was just a was it was a short at that time. Curb started in two thousand. Oh, okay, uh, mm -hmm. but that was. That first thing that they did, that first one, was just like kind of like a made-for-TV movie, right? Like it wasn't like the actual show. I mean, Kurt ran on and off with like years off in between each of its seasons. Like it ran oh, okay. for so long, but Kurt would take like two years off at a time between seasons. Yeah. Oh, damn. Because I love I love the European model. Good for Larry David. <laughs> um, but, all, you know, I, I could definitely see from the, from the jump how much they are inspired by the British office and the and curb because it feels immediately like that it is someone saying something incorrect something like you know embarrassingly dumb in public and then the rest of them having to cover for it and that does like that does stay with the show forever but um it feels like the only person that they have not yet figured out what they want from their character is d d is like still like kind of the she's kind of like the the I don't know, the moral compass a little bit of just like, I'm going to be the normal one. You guys are all going to fuck up my life. Yeah. And think, I, Jeff? I, I find it interesting that you find that D is that like normal one, because like this is a pilot that immediately you understand how horrible all four of these people are. Right. There's, there's no like, you know, easing our way into these aren't like your true beacons of like, ethics and moral compass. These are yes. people that are doing and saying the things that you only imagine idiots might do. We have yes. four idiots and D is the most normal of the four idiots while still in many senses throughout this pilot showing that she is an idiot and she is a morally corrupt human being at the same time. Yeah. What I found interesting in even like the pacing of this pilot is you get these chunks where everyone will kind of overlap talk each other when someone says something dumb, but it never gets to too high of a fervor. It's never super chaotic. It's always pretty controlled. And there's a fun little like repetitive dance to it almost where mm -hmm. someone jumps in and everyone kind of patters over them. And there's this absolute silence in the background amongst this energy. We don't really get bogged down with scores or background music. And it almost feels like the kind of beats that day and howerton had from theater training where mm -hmm, there's yes. this kind of 
like old school classical comedy element to it where it's like we're going to kind of rant and patter over each other and then it's going to come to a hush and then someone's going to do something stupid and we're going to rant and patter each other over again then it comes to a hush and i think what makes sunny effective and allows it to build to the points that it does in later seasons is that it's it's very controlled chaos early on it's very professional it's very deliberate it never feels like it's out of control. Like it always feels like they know exactly what these beats are and what they're doing. And I think it's a model that a lot of shows try to replicate in the year since and fail because yeah. you need to be really smart to pull that off and to make us like bad people and like idiots. So one of the things that I think makes this pilot so interesting in comparison to many of the other ones that we've talked about is usually when you are trying to sell a show, and sell an audience of, hey, you're going to watch the show because it's great and you feel good about watching it or you get a lot of laughs watching it. This show decides to tackle two gigantic topics <laughs> in the first episode. And the first that we're introduced to is that even in the title, the gang may be a little bit racist because we have a black man walk into the bar, uh, the Terrell. Uh, played by Malcolm Barrett, who absolutely low key one of my favorite performances in this entire pilot, and we instantly see the three people who don't know this gentleman jump into their predispositions, and it's yeah. wild for that to be one of our first blushes of these characters. Right, and this is like where we're kind of getting into the. Uh, I, this is like the second Bush term, like shift into like, okay, this is like what liberal politics politics and liberal talking points are going to be. And also like this felt the most like the office that I could have imagined. And I was like, Oh, you know, I, I didn't realize how much this felt like the shows that were I, I, like I, what an insane catalyst the British office was for just TV in general. We're, we're still doing the faux documentary thing right now like what we do in the shadows is going to have its last season coming up like it is so number one you like there's a couple rules that they play by here and um it's mac is going to be the worst of all of them and he can't shut up and then um they're all going to use any random person that's not in the core group as collateral to do what they want and and that's that's it and then there's just like chaos on top of that Ah, yes, we tied the cold open of the It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia pilot to second term Bush administration, liberal <laughs> politics and classical theater, just as I expected. <laughs> oh, my God. I, I mean, what did you guys think of the we got that reveal of the title card after this first interaction with uh, our non main character and just seeing the willingness of this cast to do the cringy jokes, to do mm -hmm. to do the things that a lot of actors wouldn't be willing to uh because it could potentially typecast them for the future of oh that's who this person is not only that rob mcelaney is the creator of this technically and yeah. i assume the main writer and he gave himself all the craziest shit to say that is the that is a strong commitment to give to yourself that you make yourself the bad guy there's a there's a moment early on in this where we get Terrell and the gang kind of sitting around a table after hours, having some after hours drinks, getting to know each other. And there's the first seeds of what is going to become Charlie Kelly in this yes. show where and Charlie Day plays it a lot calmer, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just at, at a much lower energy level, just kind of more of like a, a go with the flow, affable kind of goofy, awkward guy, not what we get to know of Charlie in the later seasons at mm -hmm. all. But there's a line where he just says to Rel, he's giving you the crazy eyes. I know that. And there was this moment where I was like, oh, right there is the seeds of all of Charlie's philosophies. It's that it's that thing where you know that it means something so much more nefarious, but we're not going to know what it is just yet, but you want to know. And it's cool seeing the most basic foundational level of a character being played out in real time. Yeah. If we start labeling any of these characters as the id or the super ego of the show, we will technically qualify for a PhD. So let's try to keep this up. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Let's talk about a scene that we see after, though, because I think that this is when we normally, you know, one thing that I noticed about this pilot that's a lot different than the rest of this show is the rest of the show is very much filmed in L.A. Like, it, it is very, oh, yeah. very famously filmed in L.A. This is the most Philadelphia version of the show we ever seen because mm-hmm. we see a lot of different shots of Philadelphia, not just B-roll, but the gang actually in Philadelphia, which is so like, I almost found it off putting because I was like, wait a minute, we're, we're, we're not on a soundstage. We're not on a set. Where the fuck are we right now? There is the most basic digital media B-roll of Philadelphia that someone clearly shot from a cab. <laughs> and and, and it, you know, a lot of it is in like the title sequence that they kept for that the, the, yeah, for, the entire forever. show. And then also using the theme music, which is, you know, public domain. It would they the way that they figured this out, and I know that they were shooting the originals like scope of the pilot and their sketches and stuff like that on those camcorders, but like they had to have gotten this like fully picked up to have all those extras. Like as soon as you start getting the I mean, there's like at the end of at the end of this, there's like 200, 300 actors in this in this pilot, which is like that's a that's no small feat. That's what a huge jump for them to all of a sudden be creating these scenes. The exterior of Patty's to this day is still a building in the arts district of Los Angeles. And if you want to understand how time has passed, not just how much nicer Sunny looks, but there was nothing in the L.A. Arts District in 2005. And the block that this exterior shot on is now surrounded by some of the nicest restaurants mm-hmm. in L.A. There is literally the L.A. outpost of the Girl and the Goat across the street from the exterior <laughs> shot of Patty's Oh, this Tom. is by Spotify headquarters? This is by Spotify headquarters. Oh, shit. This is by, like, Bestia and Bavel. We're just going to start crazy. name-dropping L.A. restaurants for local <laughs> listeners. There is so much, like, tech money and big restaurant money and luxury money surrounding the Patty's Pub exterior. So I Max, did not know that's where it was. To make this an even more uh, Philadelphia-based show about LA, can you tell us what highway and route we have to take to get to Patty's <laughs> Pub? <laughs> um, but, what, but, what, what time of day are you leaving? Where are you coming yeah, from? Yeah, <laughs> no, that's a great question. Um, I'm actually leaving from LAX. I know, worst place to be leaving from. I'm going to stop by the in and out right there as well. What a Awful great idea. decision. What, uh, a, what a great way to spend six hours of your time. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about the, I I consider this the gloves are off scene because this Uh is a scene that there is one line that immediately you have to understand, wow, the network really trusted this pilot because when Charlie, uh, when Charlie Day, who helped write this script, probably volunteered to repeat the n-word based off of a line that was used in the previous scene that was when you sort of realize like holy shit they didn't try to once again ease into being chaotic they fully dove in to being Jeff, chaotic. you have to understand this is fx's all new dark side of comedy hour <laughs> <laughs> yeah this is the network that brought you baskets, Jeff. Do you even shit on the network that brought you baskets? Zach Galifianakis, uh, I also, our, our goat. We have we have to do baskets. I fucking love that show. <laughs> A- apart from the obvious elephant in the room of Charlie's dialogue here, well, the three guys sitting outside of a coffee shop kind of awkwardly discussing how they only go here because Charlie has a crush on the waitress who works there, which also, spoiler alert, is Charlie Day's real life wife. (laughs) Um, It's the most sitcom feeling scene I think I've seen in the entire run of Sunny, that they do multiple scenes where our main people, our core group, sit at coffee shops and cafes and lament about business and crushes on people. Does it feel like Sunny at all now? It feels like classic 90s episodic sitcoms and it's just fascinating to see like knowing what this show becomes and then seeing the structure and pacing of it now it's a different world entirely yeah Yeah, and it's it's interesting you say that because they had this very normal instance and then they raunched it up with one single line of dialogue to make it oh this isn't your normal sitcom even if we do sit around in a circle, 
Do you guys remember the ads that FX would use to promote Sunny in the early seasons? Like what the network tagline was on commercials? No. They used to say out loud, it's like Seinfeld on crack. That is how they pitched It's Always Sunny in ads on TV. I I think we found it. Oops, it's all Kramers. I think Sunny is. Yeah, that is. (laughs) (laughs) What? When did I say that? Was that two episodes ago? I don't the, know. The, but the all Kramers. Thing? Oops, all Kramers. <laughs> oops, all Kramers. Yeah. But uh, it had a different context when you said it, Rich. <laughs> yeah. Oh, shit. Uh, oh, yeah. No, that was really all Kramers. Uh, I, I really completely forgot about Charlie dropping that in this. Like, I really pull in the pin on the grenade because that is like, because you can only go so far after that like you have to you have to create some like truly devious shit if you have a white core character saying the n-word in public as part of two in front of his wife (laughs) as like which is insane to me well i don't Um, think wife at the time i think that she went on to date and marry him knowing that yeah (laughs) wait really they weren't already married no, they were uh i think they met during the show and that that's how it happened um to get us on track a little bit more there's there's something that like as we said we're dealing already with one big issue of the concept of a group of people potentially being if not already being racist but then also that same group of people to then be running the hottest gay bar in all of philadelphia is bonkers and yeah. it's such a it's such a big leap and it's such a great reveal that we get hints to meeting Terrell, but then when we finally see it, I was like, oh, wow, this show has such a clever way of choreographing these jokes and putting these despicable humans in great situations for the audience to just say, let me watch a car crash and no, I won't get hurt. Right. And and for for uh, uh, contextual flow here, uh, Terrell ha- is also a club promoter, like a bar promoter. And we'll get people from Temple University, which is nearby, to come out to these bars and, uh, you know, in that explanation or like explaining some story about like getting in a fight with someone in a back alley uses the uh, uses the phrase um, bust his ass up. Is that what it was like? Tore his ass up. I, yeah, tore, I, his, I tore ass his ass up. up. It and, and in a in a context where they didn't know if he was talking about fighting or about fucking some guy in an alley, <laughs> um, which was still not explained. And uh, so now all of a sudden, like Terrell is doing this for Patty's Pub, and they don't realize until a little bit into it that it is now all gay clientele. And uh, I had no idea. My memory of this show, I I did not know this was all the pilot because I remember this show. Mind us, Charlie saying the N word, uh, back front to back, uh, this this particular episode because when it becomes a gay bar and Dennis says the line, "Boys are out tonight, huh?" When he's like just like putting on like uh, like a like a gay accent or something like that when he was pretending to be gay for for the clientele there, I think about "Boys are out tonight, huh?" Every time I've walked into a bar for the last nineteen years. <laughs> <laughs> Max, I, I'm curious from your perspective of like this reveal of our secondary issue, even if the show was titled The Gang Gets Racist. Mm. I want to be very careful with how I phrase this because out of context, it's going to sound really bad. Cool. Can't wait it, for it, this it, to go on TikTok. Jeff, Jeff, editing <laughs> note for later. <laughs> it, it's the classic sitcom thing of solving one problem creates another problem inadvertently uh-huh. where you know, we we want to prove that we're not racist, so we hire Terrell with the hopes of making a more diverse clientele, not knowing that Terrell is gay and the clientele we're going to bring in is going to make Patty's quote the hottest gay bar in Philadelphia. And in, in sitcom tropes, you know, that's, oh no, we've stumbled into a new thing that we need to solve by the end of this episode, or how are we going to react to our new world? And it's fascinating to see just how everyone reacts, what their character archetype is. Max, you know, adamant opposition to this new world. Dennis being driven by money and vanity. Charlie being the most normal person in the budge who just thinks that it's great that his dead-end bar job is now successful and 
cool and you know he's having fun with it all mm -hmm. and D doesn't really play too much into the dynamic, a point they make very clear when they vote on the future of the bar and say bar owners only. Uh, yeah. So it's yes. just, we, we create a problem that we solve that creates a new problem and they have to get to a very sitcom solution to it. Yeah, it yeah. very much reminds me of a phrase of you kill one spider, you get a hundred flies, right? And Whoa, hold up, hold up. Hold I don't know if I'm taking that deal. <laughs> <laughs> How big are the flies? Are they house flies, horse flies, or are they gnats? Because I can get, the, I can get the spider out of my apartment. I don't. I didn't agree to anything about flies. <laughs> oh my so, god. Uh, okay, so now uh, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm not. I'm not. Coming, I'm not going back to the flies. Uh, <laughs> um, so now I'm just trying to think of like for our for our writers who listen for the people who are drafting up characters of their own, creating characters. Now the wants of this bar. Are Dennis or uh, D needs to be there because she has nowhere else to go. Mac needs to be there eventually because he's obsessed with Dennis. Uh, Charlie needs to be there because he's obsessed with chaos, and Dennis needs to be there because he's obsessed with his own ego. So, like, this is they have now created this vortex that, like, you know, Mac screwing this whole thing up could have gotten them out of this very easily. And like Mac being the grenade that blows up this whole situation of them being the hottest gay bar in town uh, is like, I guess, like, I don't know. I think it's I think it's well written that they're just going to he's going to foil everything. But like they have now created this vortex where everyone needs to be there, which is a difficult thing to care uh, to consider, I think. But they do it in a way, and to speak on that, Rich, they do it in a way that makes it super appealing to keep on watching, right? Because mm -hmm. we automatically know that we have two folks within our group of four that weren't, want to work against the agreed upon plan, and they want to sow even more seeds of chaos in it. But I'm sure as hell going to be watching Dennis, uh, you know, in try to get more and more tips because he gets compliments from the patrons of the bar and he and watch D get insulted that she's not making any money and watch Mac just be uncomfortable it, to the <laughs> the idea and then watch Charlie Day just be or Charlie Kelly in the pilot just be Charlie and enjoy having work to do yeah. in almost the most normal version that we see him but Let's talk a little bit, and you know, we've been talking about a 22 minute pilot for like nearly 34 minutes, which is absolutely <laughs> insane. Let's talk about how we come to solve this issue, though, because I think that this is also another big holy shit, I can't believe you're doing this in the pilot sort of thing. Mm. And for our audience, we are purposefully putting someone in a harmful situation where they are blacking out and aren't able to give consent. Mm -hmm. Then seeing said person uh, find out maybe they might not be as straight as they want it, as they believe that they were and right. finding out things about where they land on the Kinsey scale. And then also dealing with bringing back the original issue of, people potentially being racist at the end of the episode. And Max, from your perspective, how neat of a bow do you think they're tying on the end of this pilot to sort of put our gang back where they started? I think that they do a really good job of establishing callbacks and, and making this feel like a complete episode. We skipped over this a little bit, but there's a thread involving Charlie where when him and Mac are trying to do club promotion at Temple, Charlie hits it up with a girl because of his uh, unbeforenoted uh, Domino's skill set. Mm -hmm. uh, takes a girl out on a date to the coffee shop where his crush, the waitress, works, and she punches him in the face because it's revealed that he's only using her to try to make the waitress jealous. And we get a callback to Max saying, now, to clarify, when you say sister to Terrell, a line from the cold opening of this episode, God. and I think this is another one of the examples where to get away with what Sonny does, you have to have really controlled beat-for-beat beat written chaos. You have to know all of the chess moves, and that very sitcom -y callback to tie it all together is just another example in this pilot of you could tell that these people love classic TV they love comedy. 
they're they're well versed in like the beats of theater, like what blackout lines would be, and it all comes together in a very bizarre way, uh, but a very clean way on this episode. Yeah, it is like it is kind of like a let's p- let's pick out a, a episode um, arc from Three's Company, but put like some cr- absolute craziness into it. Like it is it is very sitcommy in that moment, and. Um, when Charlie invites, um, I forgot the character's name uh, on the date. Uh, Janelle. And ta- Janelle, Janelle and takes her to the coffee shop and immediately uses her as like a bargaining chip to try to get yeah. with the waitress. I'm like, oh, this is Charlie. This is that character. Th- these are anyone. Of, it's the, the rule I mentioned earlier. It's uh, uh, we are going to use anyone who's not in this core cast and even sometimes the people who are in the core cast to get what they want. And they, you see it with like the McPoyles, you see it with like, um, uh, cricket, the, the former priest that they just like progressively ruin his life throughout the entirety of the show. It is, I'm going to, I'm going to get what I want from you or use you up completely to get something I need from another character. Rich, I think it's funny that you named the two characters who are played by Jimmy Simpson and David Hornsby, who I mentioned are Kelly's yes. theater festival friends. And it's just, we're going to bring you on and you're going to hang out with your buddy, Charlie, who, you know, from your theater days, you know, 15 years ago, yep. and we're going to ruin your life for 72 yep. hours on yep. set. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I think that it is also very interesting in as this pilot ends, we find that the way that the gang started the episode is exactly how they end the episode, right? They are back in the same exact situation, but other than in the beginning, they're, you know, pissed about where they are. They are upset uh, about how poorly the bar is doing. Now, at the end of this episode, we find them celebrating how poorly the bar is doing to end the episode. And it's this, it's such a clever way of ending this episode of, yeah, we saw a ton of chaos and nothing happened. Nothing changed. This isn't a show that you need to be watching every single episode. It is very episodic in nature. And that's a really, really smart thing to do at this time of television where it feels like think about 2005. Lost is on the air. Desperate Housewives is on the air. We're watching a lot of stuff that you need to be following the plot. You can just tune in and watch Patty's Pub and see a bunch of idiots be chaotic and change nothing about their life at the end right. of the day. Yeah, well, they. I, I think by doing this too, they set up the um, that the show is not going to be about what can we do to make this bar successful. It's like we are happy with not making any money. And it sets up the, it like tees up Frank coming in as like the, the benefactor of the, of the bar um, very nicely. That's the end of this pilot, but let's talk a little bit about things that we love, things that we think deserve a little bit more shine. Max, were there any things that you loved about this pilot that you want to give a little bit more shine? I kind of gave a quick tip of the cap to it when I was talking about how the show got made, but I've got to give a thing I love to uh, Caitlin Olson's line of Sweet D, where she says, I had the craziest dream I was in Cleveland, Ohio, which is strange because I've never been to Ohio, which <laughs> is just a direct reference to her being on two seasons of the Drew Carey show. That's so funny. And it's such a meta joke if you know who she is as an actress. And it's a thing that I didn't know until preparing for today's episode. And then when you see it in real time, you're like, oh, that's just such a smart but dumb line to throw out to her right and yeah i I don't know it's it's a really fun homage to a previous sitcom character of hers rich what about yourself um well i had written down the uh i couldn't i couldn't wait to drop the the boys are out tonight line um i just (laughs) i just fucking love that line it's his line read for that is so goddamn hilarious and um i mean other than that it felt interesting to see how well formed these characters were already in the pilot of this. Cause like you could put those like young faces in any of the, uh, in any of the plots that they're going to have in season 16 or whatever they're on now. And like, it's still the same character. There is like, it's, it's very Seinfeld, no hugging, no learning. And that's like, uh, and they really stayed true to that. It is really, those characters are formed. They just add trauma to them. 
And Rich, just adding on to yours super fast, it's the line with the movement for me that really sells it. And I think adding that little twirl and snap that oh, Glenn God. Howerton does, it it gets ingrained in your head. And that's like an enduring gif, you know, nearly 20 years after the show aired because it's it's taking a physicality and adding the line reading to it and you pair it together and it's become so much more powerful than either one of those things on their own. It's just phenomenal. Absolutely. Yeah. And for myself, I think the dedication that we saw four actors have to their characters and to the mantra of their characters is really, really impressive. It's very easy to embrace being a good guy. It's very hard to embrace being just a person who has no, no morals whatsoever. So, like, I have written down, like, Glenn Howardin's character, Dennis, just becoming a chameleon is something that like I absolutely adore because he got to have so much fun just being like, oh, first I'm going to be the ringleader. Then I'm going to queer bait a ton of people. Then I'm going to realize the problem with queer baiting and get, you know, have a reckoning come to the end of it. But every person dedicated themselves to their character. That doesn't always happen in pilots. Sometimes you have to find yourself. And it's really fun seeing people instantly know, as we've said, who they are and who their character is. Let's talk a little bit about a show that's full of wait a minute moments, but wait a minute moments that stood out to you for maybe the wrong way. <laughs> um, well, I mean, obviously, uh, Charlie dropping the N-word was, uh, was a pretty big, like, oh my God, I completely forgot that was there. Um, but... I have I have one little nitpicky thing that is just like it's so TV, it's so stupid how uh, I I felt bad writing it down, but also like you don't become Philadelphia's hottest uh, gay club in one night. I'm sorry, <laughs> you don't. That's a that's a that's a clientele you build up over time. That is not Terrell can turn you into the hottest gay bar. Uh, either the if that is the case, Terrell should be the most valuable man in Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> Max, what about yourself? Yeah, I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna hit on any of the shock value stuff, and it's always sunny because like that's that's what it is. That's yeah. what it's trying to sell you and to call to wait a minute moment is to negate the tightrope they're trying to walk. I think what I would say is knowing where Sunny goes, how many scenes in this have the same pacing of like an NBC must see mm -hmm. Thursday like mm -hmm. three dudes are sitting outside of a coffee shop talking about crushes and getting lattes and it's like that's that's Frazier and Niles and it's yep. like to go back and watch Sunny from 05 does it even feel like the same type of comedy and it's interesting to see like how they shed their skin and evolve over time and I don't know if these sitcom beats work for the nature of what this show ends up becoming I, for my wait a minute moment, it's going to lead sort of directly into the in-flight question that we got. But I think that I was just stunned because I forgot completely that Danny DeVito was not in this pilot. Mm -hmm. Like, not I in this full, season. Yeah, yeah not I in the fall fully season. forgot that Danny DeVito did not, was not initially in this show. And I just kept on sitting there being like, oh yeah, Danny DeVito shows up in this scene. Nope. Danny DeVito shows up in this scene and then the end credits roll. And I'm like, where was Danny DeVito? Yeah. And then I was just like, Oh shit. Danny DeVito was never going to come. You know, it was kind <laughs> of like a, if I remember correctly, it was like a contingency of them getting greenlit for another season. It's like, okay, if we, if we get you to a second season, we will hire someone with a recognizable name. That was like, yeah. I, I think that was like their deal with FX. And I think that there's something amazing that they were able to establish without that big star in this. So it, it's it's an interesting wait a minute moment, right? Because now we've associated the show with Danny DeVito as being like from the beginning, but he wasn't. And they absolutely destroyed regardless. But that does lead to our in-flight question. We got an in-flight question from Instagram and very simply, Danny DeVito is famously not in the pilot of this show, <laughs> even though he's been in a lot of episodes since. If you could cast anyone other than Danny DeVito to be the fifth member of this crew, Ooh. who would that be? And I think there's Ooh. some very interesting directions you could go, right? Um, you know, 
we only have one main female character. If you want to add someone else in that uh, light, we could add a little bit more diversity uh, to this cast as well. What do you think, looking back and looking, thinking of that first season, who would you want to add as that fifth character? Yeah, Jeff, that's really interesting. You know, I, I definitely think there's some good points to be made about can we include more diversity? Can we include more women? Uh, but it, it, you know, being it's only sunny in 2005, <laughs> I'm going to do neither of those things. And I'm going to add Philip Seymour Hoffman to oh, the season yeah. one cast Great. It's Always Sunny. If I'm thinking about stunt casting who play big, bombastic, comedic characters in 2005, I'm going Philip Seymour Hoffman. I'm thinking about him as Dusty in Twisters, as Scotty in Boogie Nights, uh, Freddie Miles with just the most iconic introduction to the talented Mr. Ripley, or um, his character in Along Came Polly, which is like when he slips on the floor inside of the ballroom when he's playing Sandy Lyle. This is someone who plays larger than life chaotic characters to a T. Mm -hmm. And I think he would just be an absolute grenade in Patty's pub. Oh, that, that, that's such a good one. Rich, what about yourself? Um, so I think what makes the character of Frank so special and why it got so, why Danny DeVito fits so well into it is that his name has been on marquees, uh, like top of the line for like, uh, on movie posters and like, you know, has done, you know, he's in fucking Batman movies. He's in movies with Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's like, he's done a lot of stuff. He is like, he is an extremely well-renowned actor who also was willing to put himself in the most embarrassing situations possible. I think that that is like a unique thing. I don't think another like top comedian top actor would have done that maybe like Jim Carrey or something like that would have been uh, able to do something like that, but he's like too big for that. Uh, I would add in Amy Sedaris because mm. I think she is perfect at adding in the absurdity of a character of just like going and like making a fool of herself, getting that laugh however she possibly can. And you know, I really love Strangers with Candy. I loved her arc on uh, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. Like she is, she is it. And I think if they added her, it would have been like it. it still, like, uh, is this just in in place of Frank, or is this just like just anyway, a, okay? Have some fun with it. it yeah, it's right. fun to <laughs> fantasy cast the show. Just right? yeah. like, season one stunt cast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I. I definitely think like I, I definitely think she would be a perfect addition to this. All right. Follow me on this journey. I'm not <laughs> adding too much diversity, but I am adding a name and an actress that I think would fit in perfectly with this crew. And it's Jane Lynch. I think that oh. Jane Lynch would have had so much fun just being a regular on this show. Her style of comedy is perfect for this. Her line delivery is so dry and matter of fact that mm -hmm. it's something that I think would add a little bit of shock value. It, wild to say, add shock value to It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. You put in Jane Lynch and have her say some of the lines, they might be a little bit too believable uh, in each moment. So I, I think that that would be, that's the name that I sort of was just like, oh, what, who was popular in around that time who would just be a great cast. The other one was um, Sarah Silverman. I thought would be a fun oh. add to this cast as well. Okay. Like this was towards, you know, the height of her powers for the most part in a couple of stand up specials on comedy central. And it would be a lot of fun to have that sort of personality on this show, even though her comedy is very different than the show. Jeff, sure. I do think that any Christopher Guest cast member would have had a pretty safe answer for this question, though I feel yeah, like you throw uh, any of them into this. I was half expecting you to say Philadelphia Eagles quarterback Donovan McNabb, so I was kind of relieved at your answer. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, we're, we're a Weapon X podcast, so Brian Dawkins just starring in this podcast, <laughs> knocking people out for sure would be a lot of fun. Well, thank you for that in-flight question. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more at the end of the podcast about how to submit those. But let's talk about this hi the history of the show, because... It's a little bit interesting in the sense that, yes, 
Danny DeVito did not join the show until season two. So if you're looking for Danny DeVito, start at season two. But I'd highly recommend watching season one as well, because there is a lot of this show. 16 seasons and 170 episodes and counting. Um, this show is definitely one that takes its time putting out episodes. It's not very consistent, and it's seen a lot of different time slots and times of the year as well. Um, the first episode of the show had 1.42 million viewers on cable, on FX, which is really impressive, totally. given that FX was fairly new as a network trying to do comedy. Um, the show has the interesting honor of then growing in its average viewership, but then shrinking very much so because it became a summer show. And, and here's the big and, streaming really took over the audience of this show. And Nielsen does not do a good job of adding live viewers with their streaming viewers as far as data goes. So if you're looking at it and you're like, this show only had 230,000 viewers on a recent episode or 230,000 viewers on a recent episode. Yeah. But think about all the people at home who you share your Hulu login with. They're probably also watching this show. As far as awards go, really very surprising in the sense that there are only 20 nominations and four wins for this entire show's history. And unfortunately, not a single surfboard to be nominated for Damn. or found in any of the cast's home. Can't surf in um, Philadelphia. Yeah, unfortunately, you can surf where it's filmed, though, in L.A. Uh, <laughs> but as far as the history of this show, that is really it. Like, this, this show is going strong. It has made a household name out of all these actors. Um, and I'm really interested to see as it continues this journey. But Rich, Definitely. it is now time for your game of the week. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't know when the show is ever going to end. It's not like it doesn't feel like it should like, <laughs> you know, like The Simpsons kind of feels that way, like that should have been end over for a while. Anywho, um, so my game of the week is a little game I'd like to play Charlie Kelly or Florida Man. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, they put Charlie in probably some of the most crazy and dangerous scenarios on the show. And I want to know if you can pick out a Charlie Kelly uh, action or plot line versus a real crime that someone committed in the state of Florida. <laughs> All right. So first one, we have uh, this person set up a trap to cover a foe's face in hornets. Hmm. Attacking person with hornets i'm gonna go florida man yeah i was gonna say that sounds very florida to me that was charlie kelly charlie kelly did this in the episode where the waitress was going to get married um, oh you're said, right that florida <laughs> thing didn't happen in a Publix parking lot so it couldn't have been a florida <laughs> man thing yeah i have tried to remove any sort of connection to florida or philadelphia that uh from each of these um all right second one this person ended up catching a kilo of cocaine on their reel in a local fishing trip Florida man. Charlie Day. That one is Florida man. <laughs> oh, <laughs> damn. <laughs> All right. A uh, a person claiming to be half dog bites the face of their neighbor in a in a uh, manic episode. Charlie Kelly. I'm gonna say Charlie Day, yeah. That's Florida man. <laughs> this is oh. this is one of <laughs> this is one of my favorite games that I've done now. All right, uh next one. Uh after an altercation with teenagers, this perpetrator slammed a child into a car door. Charlie on, Kelly. On tape. Yeah. <laughs> it has to be right sometime. Charlie Kelly, sure. <laughs> uh, that one is Charlie Kelly. That yeah, is, uh, great job. That is a crazy one. Um, this person got a DUI in a golf cart while after blowing a .3 BAC. Charlie Kelly. <laughs> I'm going to say Florida Man. <laughs> this one is Florida Man. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, this loose cannon attacked a Santa, uh, a mall Santa, mid-meet and greet by biting them in the neck. That's just any Philadelphia Eagles game, so I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Philadelphia <Man>. Eagles fan. <laughs> uh, it was Philadelphia Eagles fan Charlie Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, this perpetrator was caught with a bag of drugs because it was labeled bag full of drugs. <laughs> Charlie Kelly. I'm going to say Charlie Kelly. It was Florida, man. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. 
This is like the lowest batting average uh, game that we've had so far. I'm so proud I mean, of myself. I mean, they're so <laughs> close together. Uh, the lines are based, the circles are basically the same. Uh, well, <laughs> Rich, thank you very much for your game of the week. Gentlemen, as our flight comes to a land, I have two questions for you. And one is, based off of the pilot and the pilot alone, would you keep on watching or are you going to keep on watching It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia? There's a ton of episodes available to you and a lot of things to look forward to, including Danny DeVito. And secondly, 17 seasons we're coming up on of the show. There's going to be a lot more of it unless, you know, Rob McElhenney continues to acquire professional sport teams and then realizes he doesn't have time to film the show anymore. So I guess I'm curious. Do you think that there is a need for It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia in today's TV landscape? Or do you think, hey, they've had a good run. Make some room for someone else. 2.20 2.20 p.m. on a Friday. Max is going to go watch more. It's always sunny in Philadelphia. <laughs> uh, yeah, this this is a yes for me. I'm not normally a cringe humor kind of guy, but I think this is so character-centric, and I think that the beats and the joke structure is just so much smarter than a lot of other cringe humor shows that it, it 100% draws me in. This is basically gun smoke for comedy at this point. It feels like it's never going to die, but... They also just keep finding ways to change their circumstances and introduce new people and send people on these tangents that it really does feel infinite in a weird way. And as long as it just keeps making people laugh and FX kind of just keeps finding a corner for it while they have all this Disney money now, let it do its thing. When it's time, let them hang it up. But it's not getting... Uh, Emmy nominations. It's not doing anything in the critical sphere. It's just maintaining its audience. What harm is it causing anyone? Let them have their little slot. Rich, what about yourself? Um, I personally think, in uh, number one, absolutely, I'm watching another episode of this. I cannot believe how much of the early years of uh, It's Always Sunny was just the pilot. I it is It has really stayed with me. But I do think I think they should really keep making it not in the sense that like, Oh, people want like a comfort show or something like that. It's because they keep coming up with new shit. Like uh, a friend that watches it still consistently said, like, I can't remember if it was season 15 or 16 was like one of their favorite seasons. I'm like, that's super impressive. I felt that way about um, Portlandia. I think the last season of Portlandia is one of their best seasons. Um, I think with how few comedy things are getting greenlit right now, keep going, keep making it, put, put more actors in it, develop more funny people. Like it is, I, it is like a testament to how comedy should be like funded and dealt with. And I just like, I hope they really keep going like un, until they, they decide themselves to call it quits. Yeah. And for myself, I would, I love episodic shows that I don't need to watch every single one. Right. Right. I don't, I, I don't feel like I have a chore to do, or I don't mm-hmm. feel like, you know, I can pick a random episode and say, okay, I'm going to jump in here. And maybe there are some things that I need context for that I haven't had it, but this is one of those shows that does an excellent job with that. As far as the show coming to an end, according to IMDB, we're getting at least two more seasons of it. Right. And the way that I like to think about it is that, you know, Looking at this group of actors, we have three folks that use this as their writing outlet and obviously enjoy writing episodes to this day. Like Glenn Howerton, Rob McElhenney, and Charlie Day all wrote the pilot and they all take turns writing new episodes as the seasons come out. And that's a lot of fun to be able to enjoy working with a group of people, making something that you love and making TV that people talk about and people Mm -hmm. constantly talk about this show. So why give it up unless you get to the point where, you know, you're the Simpsons and Matt Groening and you're starting to eat yourself and you're (laughs) like, Oh, do I, do I keep on eating myself? I'm pretty tasty and the checks are pretty good. And I hope that this, that fate never befalls the show and they find the time when they say, you know what, what's good is good. What's done is done. And we'll have one more season and hopefully we don't land the plane like Seinfeld did. But mm. 
We have landed this flight and this episode of TV Pilots License. But before we go, where can folks find you too? Max, where can folks find you? You can catch me giving you the crazy eyes. And on all <laughs> things social media, at Max Sig, you can find original sketch comedy for myself and Rich over on TikTok at Dad Wagon Comedy. Rich? You can, you can find me running the hottest gay bar in Philadelphia. Damn and you it. can also find me on Instagram. <laughs> and damn, that's Rich. <laughs> You son of a bitch, you <laughs> stole my... Oh, God. Uh, and you can find me playing dominoes just anywhere. I, I can do it by myself, too, but that's nice. a lot less fun. Uh, but if you're looking for the TV Pilots License, you can find us anywhere you listen to your podcast. You can also watch our smiling faces on YouTube as well at TV Pilots License. If you're looking for me, you can find me on social media at Run Jeff Run. If you have a question about the show, maybe for our next episode, you can email us at tvpilotslicense at gmail.com or give us a call at 213-290-1713. Make sure to watch out for our socials. We like to preview some of the stuff that we have coming on or going on and some of the folks that are coming on the podcast. But with the plane landed and the seatbelt sign off, we look forward to flying the bright skies of the TV world with you again soon. And until then, go birds. Boys are out tonight, huh? Ha, 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 ha.